Hello and welcome to today's webinar made possible by the Molina Cares Accord on engaging families in program and policy development to advance health equity. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over a few logistics. To eliminate background noise, audio lines are muted during today's event. There will be a moderated question and answer session following today's presentations. You may submit a question online anytime by clicking the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your screen. Instructions are shown on the screen at this time. Today's event will be recorded and shared publicly on chcs.org. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you please complete a brief online evaluation that will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is very important to us, and we hope that you'll take a moment to do this. I will now turn the webinar over to Anna Spencer, Senior Program Officer at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Travis, and welcome everyone to this afternoon's webinar. We are excited to share information on the Center for Family Voice, which is a new and innovative center at Groundwork Ohio focused on engaging with parents and families in program and policy discussions, as well as some best practices for doing this kind of work. I am uh, very grateful to our speakers who are on the line today. Um, and would like to take this moment to acknowledge our funder, Molina Cares Accord, for supporting this important work. Um, so just a look at today's agenda. Uh, first, we'll hear from Carolyn Ingram from Molina Cares Accord about their interest in investing in the Center for Family Voice. Um, we'll hear from Groundwork Ohio on their vision and goals for the center. And then we have um, just a couple of minutes on best practices that we learned um, throughout this project and then speakers from Queens Village in Cincinnati, Ohio, and the nationally focused um, Family Voices about their experiences supporting and partnering with parents and families. Um, as Travis mentioned, there's a Q&A uh, at the end of the session. Um, at any time, you should feel free to enter questions into the chat, and um, we can try to get to those at the end. And so um, next slide, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, today's speakers. We have Carolyn Ingram, who is the Executive Vice President of External Affairs at Molina Cares Accord. We have Shannon Jones, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Groundwork Ohio. Jocelyn Okorodudu, who is a Community Engagement Strategist at Queen Village. And Kara Coleman, who is the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy at Family Voices. And again, uh, my name is Anna Spencer, and I'll be um, moderating today's session. Um, so next slide, just before I turn it over um, to Carolyn, I wanted to share a little bit about the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Um, for those who are not familiar, familiar with our organization, um, we are based in New Jersey and we work with stakeholders across the na nation to strengthen healthcare services to ensure better and more equitable outcomes, particularly for um, the children and adults that are served by the Medicaid program. Um, we partner with state and federal agencies, health plans, providers, community-based organizations, and consumers to make healthcare work better for people who are facing um, serious barriers to their well-being. And this includes poverty, um, complex health and social needs, and systemic racism. Um, we work to advance uh, more effective care delivery models, so um, uh, advanced primary care and integrated care models, uh, more efficient policy and program design, and across all our work, we have a more intentional focus on um, equitable care and opportunities to ensure health equity for people facing um, the greatest disparities in their lives. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Carolyn Ingram um, to say a few words. Thank you so much, Anna, and welcome everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on uh, where you are joining us from in the United States. My name is Carolyn Ingram. And I'm the executive director of the Molina Healthcare Charitable Foundation. I want to talk to you just a little bit about um, the commitment from the Molina Cares Accord and the work that we do uh, from the Charitable Foundation and states. On our next slide, um, you'll see some of the areas that we really focus on, but specifically into the work that um, Family Voices is really bringing out in this approach. We were really excited to come to the table and help to fund this. Um, for folks who haven't met me, I used to be a Medicaid director in a state. And one thing I was always looking for was ways to make sure that we brought consumer voices to the table in terms of what happened in their healthcare 
And it's hard to, to really find folks who have the time to be able to contribute to that, but also um, really be able to um, speak up about the services and the care that they need. And so we were really glad to partner with um, Groundwork Ohio to bring this to the table in terms of some of our work. Uh, one of the reasons that Melina started um, the Charitable Foundation and launched the Melina Cares Accord was really to start looking at how to better address racial disparities in access to care and the delivery of care, along with really looking at how other social economic impact um, areas around social determinants of health and um, people's um, environments really did affect their outcomes in their care. And so with partnering with Groundworks Ohio, we were able to um, really start to bring some of those voices that we wanted to hear about to the table to look at some of these issues around racial health disparities and really share this model with um, Medicaid programs throughout the nation. And so we're very thankful for their hard work and the work of the Center for Healthcare Strategies to really bring this model to light and to be able to share it across several different communities so that people can learn from the great work that they're doing out there. Um, on our next slide, uh, you'll see a little bit about what Groundworks is, is working on, and I'm gonna turn it over to them pretty soon to tell you about it. But um, one of the things I think you'll learn about today is that really this kind of best in class approach to really engage families in public service and how that can help shape policy at the regulator level, which we know is really important in determining how we run and operate programs across the country, but really also how you give voices to people when they have a healthcare issue that they need help with in terms of making that decision for themselves or for their families. And we know that when um, individuals are given that voice, especially pregnant women, um, they're able to better cope with some of the services that they need, but also get the care that they really need for themselves and for their families to have better health outcomes. And that's really what we're striving for um, in terms of the efforts around the Molina Cares Accord and the work that it does communities is really to lift up and build a stronger community um, through one life at a time. And so today I'm really excited to turn this over now to Shannon so that she can tell you a little bit about the work that they're doing and um, really start to bring to the forefront um, the work of Groundwork Ohio. So Shannon, do you wanna go ahead? Great, thank you so much, uh, Carolyn, for your encouragement during this process, uh, as well as the support from the Molina Cares Accord. Um, so this, I'll just talk briefly about what we've been doing this year to amplify family voice that's really focused around equitable outcomes for children. Next uh, slide, please. So just a little bit about who we are. We're a nonpartisan public research and advocacy organization that's been around um, for about 15 years now, really focused in this prenatal to age five space. So our interest is always in those issues, whether they be health, um, education, uh, economic, that really lay the strong foundation for Ohio kids, families, and communities. Next slide, the Center for Family Voice is kind of our way at groundwork to establish a center of excellence that really reminds us that we have to authentically engage with Ohio parents um, in policies and practices that impact the healthy development of their children. So this is an ongoing process, um, and it's one that's focused on eliminating the disparities that serve pregnant women, young children, and the families that care for them. The next slide, please. Um, here's kind of three basic uh, focus areas for the Center for Family Voice. Um, it was really developed as a way to respond to what we were experiencing in the policy making and advocacy fields that often policies um, were passed without really even engaging with the families that the policies were gonna be impacting. So we wanted to really try to include families in this you know, it's kind of front and center in the policy making world. 
The second was, you know, we utilize a, a very extensive Ohio and national environmental scan of all of the types of family engagement strategies that are out there. I mean, there's there are folks on this panel today, they're going to talk about some of their strategies and why it's important. But I think across the child serving systems, there is a growing understanding that we need to um, better engage the families that we're trying to serve. And finally, there was extensive, not only literature review done, but also uh, pretty in-depth interviews with over 40 uh, programs that are way ahead of us in their family engagement strategies. Next slide. Um, this is a short video that I think captures the uh, essence of the Center for Family Voice, and we'll talk on the other side. We're excited to create the Center for Family Voice at Groundwork Ohio, an initiative designed to ensure that families' experiences and their ideas inform how governments and communities support young children. We're dedicated to creating a center of excellence that authentically involves Ohio families in transforming policies to ensure more children are born healthy, meet important developmental milestones, and get the early learning and interventions they need. The goal is to be better at building the foundation that sets up children for success. We are passionately committed to equity, eliminating the entrenched disparities in systems that serve pregnant women, young children, and families. The center will be an authoritative resource for policymakers in Ohio and across the country who are committed to listening to families. We will empower families by increasing their advocacy skills, expanding their connections, and building their confidence. We will inspire stakeholders by demonstrating the impact of giving families the chance to co-create solutions, honoring family contributions, building inclusive cultures, and we will develop partnerships that value families' experiences Finally, we will use these strategies to transform policy to improve outcomes for families and their young children. The Center for Family Voice. It's a place where families have a real say about how we support them. Thank you, Travis. So as we you know, as the video really outlined is we have this theory around how do we not only engage with parents, but how do we amplify their voice? How do we um, empower them to be the best advocates for their, themselves and their children? And so for us, we've started by adopting this definition, which is an authentic partnership between professionals and family leaders who reflect the diversity of the communities they represent, working together at the systems level to develop and implement better policies and practices. I mean, we know from the research that's out there, we know anecdotally from talking to parents and certainly program leaders who are serving the needs of parents, how important it is that we really listen to them. And so this is kind of the heart with which the center is based. Next slide, please. Here's you know, how we've laid out in the report, and thanks, uh, Travis, for putting the link into the uh, chat box for us, um, that if you'd like to see the full report, you can do that. But what we're really trying to do is not um, duplicate or replicate or get in the way of really good family engagement that exists at the local level or in programs already. Um, what we're trying to do is come up alongside perhaps some of those that already exist, learn from them, um, develop the trusting relationships with them, and see how we can move the participation of families along this continuum so that eventually the system is really responding to the parents directly. How do we make systems really think about not just doing things for parents, but doing things with parents. And what we really you know, are trying to tackle here is 
it's impossible for large systems, whether they be insurance companies, managed care corporations, large hospital systems, even um, Medicaid departments to directly and authentically engage themselves with parents. But how can we lift up those parent voices? How can we help support those parents so they are speaking you know, for themselves and on behalf of their children to those um, systems that are trying to meet their needs? And how can we also encourage those systems to really listen to and respect and honor those, those authentic um, experts, those with lived experience? Next slide. So the, the handful of principles that we've really focused on as we think about this work is obviously operationalizing equity is at the heart of it. It's not just the work that we do as individual members of the groundwork team, but how we um, integrate it into all of our work um, across all of our centers and policy areas. It's really important that our own organization have a strong understanding about equity, we reflect those values and that we're you know, all committed to um, respecting the lived experience of uh, parents and families. Building trust is the currency that we have to deal in. And so it's not about um, doing things on behalf of families or parents. It's really listening to them and developing that trust and doing things alongside of them. It's honoring the relationships that already exist. The most important relationship that exists between a parent and their child, parents are their children's best advocates and we ought to honor that uh, trusted relationship. But we also have to honor the relationships between program leaders and parent engagement specialists who, are, who they themselves have developed trust along the way. Um, it's really important that as we're doing our work, that we do it in a way that um, conforms to the communities in which we're operating in, not trying to replace um, what already exists. Um, respecting the experts. There's all sorts of experts that come to play in policy development work, but certainly um, that needs to be centered on the experts of the, of the parents and the families who are making the decisions and are dealing with um, the challenges and their real life in many cases of, of how they see, you know, best see fit to serve their own children. And really, how can we shift the culture? Thinking about um, how do we, we shift from that idea that professionals in policy development and advocacy and administration of programs know best to a, to a place where the culture is about listening and honoring the um, experts who know best, the parents and families. Next slide. So a lot of best practices came to the forefront and I know Anna is gonna spend some time talking about these because they were really uniform across um, all of the interviews that we did and we saw it again in the literature. But the one thing that I would point out um, while they're all important is the exercising humility. I mean, that's something that groundwork is really trying to own and um, embrace in this work because we don't profess to know the answers. That's not our role here. What the Molina Cares Accord has really done in working with us is giving us the ability to think about and engage with families in a unique way, support those families and those who are serving those families, and think about how we can really connect them to the policies and the systems to better meet their needs. So um, a lot to unpack in the best practices, but I think the, the exercising humility really sticks out. The next slide, please, is you saw this come to life in the video. 
And it's really, you know, how we think about am amplification and it has many, you know, many phases, you know, how we support and build the capacity for families by um, expanding their connections and supporting them through increasing their skills and, and really, you know, helping their confidence. It's how we are engaging with our local stakeholders and not only encouraging them to connect with families, but how we can help them listen to the families. What are some processes by which they can engage that make them better program administrators or local stakeholders that are supporting the, the work in the community? really working to develop effective partnerships. So how do we unify all of those stakeholders that are working around uh, the policy making efforts to really integrate the concept and the culture and the commitment to making family voice uh, a necessary piece of the work that they're doing. And then ultimately, really lifting all of that up to advance the policy transformation that's happening at the system level, at the state policy making level. Um, that, that's kind of our frame of reference. Next slide, please. So just a couple of things to leave you to think about. It's what we spend our time thinking about at Groundwork. Um, now that we've done this report, we've done this literature review, and we've done all these interviews, how are we taking this to the next level and what, what's our vision as we see um, the center developing? Um, so you'll see that you know, we intend to advocate for uh, the ways that we can recognize and support families um, in, a, in a, not a one-off way, but sort of a systematic way um, so that they can, can help us in the ongoing policy conversations. We want to invest in some projects around the state. You know, our frame of reference is that prenatal to five frame. Um, and so we're going to invest in some projects that um, strengthen those local partnerships that are doing really great work in local communities. And so how can we elevate the learnings from those local communities, enhance the learnings in the local communities, and lift that up to statewide policy so that we can start perhaps scaling or spreading um, some unique practices that we know are being developed at the local level. Uh, we want to develop and support a statewide family action network. So not only is it important that we learn from families, but that families can learn from each other and that they can bring their own experience to the table and as they themselves work through um, solutions to, to challenges. Um, we want to build and sustain a, a family leadership fellowship. So how do we really contribute to the development of these experts? Um, so it's on one hand, honoring the lived experience and valuing their time and commitment to um, our shared goal of improving policy and practice. But how do we um, create this infrastructure that lives beyond an individual program or um, practice change. We want to foster the use of best practices. You know, all of these, you know, things like a statewide family action network. It's how we start to share and cross pollinate um, and provide a, a constant feedback loop from the families that are sharing their lived experience with the systems that are trying to meet their needs. One of the things that we are thinking a lot about and really trying to analyze and get right is how do we develop meaningful process and outcome metrics so we can track this. So we know that this is important. It anecdotally is important. We experience it at the programmatic level that um, you know, we hear from families who have a higher level of satisfaction when they're engaged in the um, policy making around their programs, but how do we measure that? So trying to figure out um, not only for our purposes to be able to track progress and to lean in what's, to what's working, 
But as we look to um, one of the you know, important things that we're trying to do, which is to share that out. So our focus is prenatal to five, but there's no reason why we can't, others who are working in policies in the aging population or um, spe other special populations, maybe with unique healthcare needs. There's no reason why they can't be learning from this work too. So how do we measure success? And then how do we, we not only um, implement in our work, but we share that work out so others can benefit from our learnings. And then clearly securing sustainable funding that provides not just the consistency as we're measuring and tracking progress and elevating um, parents to be their own best advocates, but having some flexibility too to be able to adapt as parents are informing us that, that we need to do that. Next slide. So thank you for the chance to be able to share just a little bit, but I wanna draw your attention to the website. So the video and um, the report are accessible on our website too, if you'd like to check it out. And I'll turn it back over to uh, Anna and uh, look forward to the panel as we continue on the, with the webinar. Uh, thank you so much, Shannon, that was great. Um, so I just wanted to spend uh, a couple of minutes talking about um, some of the best practices that we learned through the environmental scan and also drawing on um, other work that the Center for Healthcare Strategies is engaged um, on around patient and family engagement. Um, I encourage folks to check out the report. Um, it's available in the chat right now, um, which includes a much more comprehensive list of considerations for engaging um, with parents and families. Um, but I just kind of wanted to pull out a couple and really dig into, you know, kind of the layers of, of um, each of these strategies. Um, so next slide, Travis. Um, particularly for families with young children and those with special health care needs, um, there can be significant barriers to participating in, in engagement activities. Um, families can face challenges getting to events, finding appropriate child care, um, getting time off work. So it's really important for conveners of these sessions to think about um, ways they can be supportive. Um, that includes providing on-site child care, including um, perhaps specialty child care, um, hosting events at times that are convenient for working parents and at locations um, that are familiar and easy to access by families. Um, so a lot of these uh, best practices are kind of from the health systems, uh, social service systems, like from the Medicaid lens. Um, so healthcare organizations thinking about stepping outside the institution and um, really engaging with parents and families in their communities. Um, it's important to ground uh, these sessions in culturally appropriate traditions and um, for healthcare organizations that um, have significant populations that are non-native um, English speakers um, to offer translation services, not only in the actual events, but um, in any sort of print materials that are produced as part of those learning sessions um, or that convey kind of follow-up um, information. Um, making accommodations for families who want to participate virtually is important, um, especially in this sort of world of COVID, um, parents with very, very vulnerable children um, won't necessarily want to participate in, per in person. Um, we are all proficient at conducting our work on Zoom, um, but I think it behooves healthcare organizations to think about um, providing some technical support so that um, parents that come to these virtual meetings are, are not um, sort of are, are able to participate um, and kind of get over any sort of technological barriers that they might face. And lastly, um, it's really important to be flexible um, for all the parents in the audience. Um, sometimes the best laid plans don't often come to fruition as hard as we try. So it's important to maintain um, you know, a sense of humor and some flexibility um, during sessions, you know, actual events, but also recognizing um, that sort of despite parents sort of um, willingness and interesting interest in attending that um, they might not be able to consistently show up, but keeping a door open um, and sort of a welcoming um, stance is really important. And so next slide. 
um, building trust um, is, is really important to develop meaningful partnerships with parents and families. Um, and this takes time and it really takes uh, sort of a concerted um, effort. Um, it's important, we heard from stakeholders that um, these can't be sort of a one and done, um, but, but to develop long-term relationships um, just takes time and effort. There needs to be a demonstrated commitment from um, leadership on down through the staff ranks that um, these engagement activities are important. Um, and this can be done through messaging, um, through the availability of sort of resources to support these engagement activities, um, having a dedicated staff person who's always there as a point of contact um, to interact with patients and families is, is um, important. Um, organizations that are looking to learn from parents and families need to be clear about the goals of engagement up front um, and um, be really clear about how the information they are collecting will be used, um, what might be some key milestones and next steps. Um, so to have sort of a closed loop on, you know, uh, what will be done with the, the uh, information and you know, sometimes uh, information, it's, it's not always actionable, but I'm um, being able to sort of explain um, along the way. Um, developing sort of processes with families for communicating this information um, is a trust building exercise. Um, it's important to ask parents how they want to receive information um, and really honor that preference. Um, and as Shannon says, uh, or, or shared earlier, you know, being open and humble during these interactions is is really critical. Um, parents are the experts in their own lives, and we heard loud and clear um, that healthcare organizations really shouldn't underestimate parents' ability not only to identify their community priorities, but really to own the solutions um, and be part of moving this um, equity agenda forward. And so next slide. Um, so uh, Shannon um, talked a bit about um, the impetus for creating the Center for Family Voice. It's really the recognition that families are not often at the table of, um, during these program and policy decisions. Um, and this really has a direct impact on their health and well-being. Um, and so the center really seeks to better understand uh, families' needs and preferences, um, and really to integrate this into sort of moving, addressing health disparities and driving an equity agenda. So rooting conversations with families in racial and health equity um, really can serve to disrupt existing biases and institutional racism um, and is a really critical step to addressing the pervasive health disparities that exist for many communities, um, not only in Ohio, but across the nation. Um, healthcare organizations um, can consider hiring those with lived experience um, to support um, engagement activities. Um, and sort of along with other work that they do, um, but this really sort of ensures that their workforce is representative of the communities that they're trying to serve. Um, it promotes a higher level of understanding on the part of healthcare organizations, um, sort of what community sort of needs and priorities are, and can also help to legitimize engagement activities. Um, also, uh, I know healthcare organizations and um, Medicaid programs are really, um, you know, actively trying to partner with community-based organizations, especially um, with this um, uh, focus on addressing social needs, health-related social needs, social determinants, um, but sort of developing and expanding um, partnerships with organizations that serve BIPOC, BIPOC communities can improve under, understanding um, and also is really an effective way um, to, to address disparities um, and um, improve equity. And so next slide. Um, again, meaningful and um, authentic engagement requires that healthcare organizations sometimes um, cede some of its um, traditional power, um, decision-making power. Um, and this includes both in um, individual interactions, but also sort of um, with respect to um, allocating community resources and reinvesting um, healthcare dollars. Um, establishing processes that um, help to build community power and promote shared decision making um, can improve engagement activities um, and really, again, serve to build trust with families. There's a long historical mistrust of healthcare organizations. Um, so coming to these discussions sort of on equal footing um, really sort of promotes not only that power sharing, but um, trust building. 
So some examples include um, shared governance, um, having a distributed leadership model, um, and using a strategy such as human-centered design, um, which is an iterative approach to problem solving that um, takes into consideration sort of community, parent, family input, and healthcare input, and um, sort of along the way uh, to help sort of build programs and adjust policies um, in a way that works for um, everybody involved. And lastly, um, it's, and this is sort of along the lines of sort of ceding their traditional sort of decision-making power. It's important for healthcare organizations to allow for processes to be more parent and community driven, um, which really means sort of a, a shift in typical um, business as usual practices. So having you know, an open mind and willingness um, to engage with parents and families on, on what this looks like. And so next slide. Um, finally, um, many parents and families um, may be new to participating in engagement activities. Um, despite sort of a willingness, they just might be unfamiliar with these more sort of formal um, practices such as um, community advisory boards um, and maybe unfamiliar again with healthcare decision-making processes. Um, so there's really a lot that um, healthcare organizations and systems can do to support capacity building opportunities and to help community members really improve their leadership skills um, and make for these collaborations to be um, more productive and effective. So these can include um, facilitation training, um, budget skills, communication, advocacy, offering course credits or continuing education. Um, and really, these are sort of modest investments um, in training that can really add value for parents um, and improve partnership outcomes. So like I said, this is not a complete list. It's sort of a mashing together of some of the themes um, that are listed in the report. Um, one thing I will flag that's not in there, but we heard um, over and over again is compensating parents for their time and expertise. Um, and, and this can be done through a number of ways, including sort of financial gift cards, childcare food. Um, but um, with that, I would like to turn it over uh, to Jocelyn um, from Queens Village um, to share a little bit. Thanks, Jocelyn. Thanks, Anna. Um, thank you everyone for joining me today. And I'm really, really excited to share with you guys some um, information about Queens Village. But first, what I want to say is that I am so excited to hear what I've heard today from Anna and from Shannon. A lot of the themes that I heard, you will also hear in the presentation that I'll be giving today. And it lets me know after about 15 years of being involved in community work, that at least here in Ohio, we are starting to get some things right. So really excited to hear that. Um, what I can say first about Queens Village is that we are a program that was that was built from the ground up by a group of Black women in Cincinnati, and this was for the purpose of reducing Black infant mortality in our city. Uh, next slide. And I don't really have a mu much to say here. I think what you need to know about me is I'm Jocelyn. I work for Queens Village really passionate about this work and excited to share it with you. Next slide. Um, what I'd like to start with is something again that you heard when Shannon was talking and that is about how authentic relationships are at the center of all that we do here with Queens Village and um, is really the most important piece of our work because we are dealing with the population, we're dealing with black women. And these are a group of people who unfortunately have been disenfranchised in this country. We, have, we are working with a group of women who have seen it all before, they've heard the game, they know the game, and they are so used to folks coming into their communities, claiming to want to help, and then witnessing time after time as the promises that were made to them are broken. And so for us to have gotten anywhere in our work, we really had to start by building authentic relationships with the community of women and also by building trust. Next slide. And how we started to go about this effort of building trust with our community and it is, um, 
extending trust to Black women and pushing against that, that narrative, that typical narrative that we hear about Black women, those typical ways that we engage with Black women and the typical activities because we did not want to see and we don't want to see typical results. And so what we had to think about is what happens when you go into a community and all you see is need and all you see is deficit, all you see are victims. Are the conversations that you have with these victims, are they respectful? Are they a, give, a mix of give and take that you have with folks that you see as your equals? Are we casting ourselves as saviors in this narrative? And is this what Black women want? Next slide. And so what we have chosen to do instead was to see Black, Black women in their best light. And so I, as a Black woman, I have plenty of examples of Black women in their best light. I can tell you about what I think when I think about Black women. And I can tell you, I think about my mom, I think about my aunts, my sisters, my friends. And I think about all the, wit the wisdom that has been shared with me. I think about all those come to Jesus moments that I truly did need. And then I also think about the laughter and the joy and the hugs. Next slide. And because we have been able to shift our mindset, we have been able to shift what we see it as our job, what we are here in this community to do. Rather than uh, helping victims, we see it as our job to let Black women be who they are, and to do what they do. And also we give them the freedom to say what they truly have to say about the circumstances that they live in in our city. Next slide. And so when we go into these communities looking to build authentic relationships of mutual respect and mutual uh, trust, what did Black women have to say when we finally asked them for their perspective on this issue of infant mortality? And these five buckets that you see in front of you is where our work has focused because of these sometimes raw, sometimes teary, warm, friendly conversations that we've had, one-on-one -on -one conversations that we've had with the Black women in our community and them telling us what they were missing, what they were missing in our city and how they wanted us to serve them. Next slide. And so we, both fo we first focused on reducing black women's stress. What black women have told us time and time again is that they are under a huge amount of stress they are asked to wear masks at work. They're asked to, they have so many responsibilities at home and they need some time to themselves. They need time for, to rest and relax. They're isolated. They want some time to manage their stress and they want to do this in community with other women. And so some of the events that we have engaged in have focused on reducing Black women's stress. And you see a picture here. Some of those events have focused around providing them with opportunities to give uh, positive coping mechanisms for stress. So we have yoga, we've had mindfulness. Some of our events have just been able to give Black women at time, at least a, a couple times a month or a, sometimes one time a month where they can be themselves. On the first Wednesday of each month and in our city, we have Queens Village meetings. And so these are opportunities for Black women to come in. They can drop their kids off and with our childcare. They don't have to worry about dinner that night. They don't have to wear their mask when they're with us. And they can at least once a month be who they are, be themselves and not have to worry about anything else. Next slide. What they also told us very clearly is that they are tired of the narrative that they hear about Black women. And so 
one of the most joyous pieces of our work has been creating these spaces for Black women to be celebrated and for their voices to be heard. And we've done, we've done this many different ways. But the latest way that we are um, engaging in this work is by having the In Her Voice concert. And this is going to be happening on September 25th in a couple weeks. I um, And this is an opportunity for uh, Black women to be celebrated, to be heard. There's going to be Black women poets. There's Black women singers. There's Black women rappers. And this is just an opportunity for Black women to kind of bask in celebration and in their brilliance and to be um, just to be celebrated. I'm dropping the link to the Eventbrite in the chat. Next slide. The third way that we have gone about um, listening to Black women is about hearing them when they said that they wanted opportunities for their leadership to be invested in. And this is some place where I have a personal story here that I'd like to share. When I started in this work about three years ago, I actually onboarded into this work by being a member of the community advisory board. And at that time, I didn't have a lot of knowledge about public health. I didn't have a lot of knowledge about infant mortality. But what I did have was my experience as a Black woman living in this city. And so because the people that I work with value that experience and that expertise, they, I was able to get a position with um, Queens Village, move on to senior leadership positions, and now I am presenting this information to you today. And so this is what we mean, or these type of things are what we mean when we say we really, Black women would really like to see investment in their leadership capabilities. Next slide. Black women also told us that that one of the, the sources of their stress was that they felt as though they lacked economic opportunities. Many of them told stories of being in jobs for five, 10 years without any opportunity for advancement. And so one of the things that we did this last year was to create a professional pathway through healthcare and through um, entrepreneurship that was specifically for Black women. We, we paid them for their time when they were training. We provided opportunities for childcare. We, all, we covered the cost of all the training. And then we also provided them with a community. So this is a group and a cohort of women who are all going through the same situation together with the purpose of making it to the end. And we, end, we are ending this in October after a whole year, we have women who have gotten jobs. We have women who have businesses now. And these are things that we were able to engage in because we listen to Black women. Next slide. And then we were also, we also were told to engage not only with the medical communities, but also to engage in the social and political communities because we know that there are some things that are going on in the lives of Black women that cause them to be at higher risk for poorer outcomes before they become pregnant and before they take one step into the doctor's office. And so it's not only medical communities that need to listen to Black women, it's the education system that needs to listen to Black women, it's politicians that need to, that need to listen to Black women, and we have made um, sure that Black women have opportunities to be heard by these folks who are in their community, the leaders of their community. Next slide. And so what I would like to share is what some of the outcomes that have come from us being able to engage Black women authentically, build trust with Black women. And that has been, some, um, some of them has been, it has been friendship. It has been an opportunity to gather with Black women in your community and lay your burdens down. We have been able to build five neighborhood boards of Black women in Cincinnati who are advising 
the infant mortality work in our county. And we, what we had in year 2020 was the lowest Black infant mortality rate that has been on record for Black infants. And so this, this is the work that has come, or these are the outcomes that have come from trusting and believing in Black women. And if you would like any more information about Queens Village, you can go to blackwomenforthewin.com. Thank you. Jocelyn, thank you so much. Um, and I am just gonna turn it straight over to Carol Coleman from Family Voices. Whoops, I did video, but not unmute. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so I am also so grateful um, to be here today. And you know, it's really a tremendous webinar and panel when you can drop the mic on everyone who talks before you, like the points that are made and really the best practices and the principles that are around that amplifying the voice, I think as, as Shannon said, are this is, this is not something just for early childhood community. This is for all human beings and people and how we ensure in this time where we're hopefully really authentically beginning to focus on equity and making change. You know, how can we make sure that everyone's voice is included? Um, so I'm here to talk to you for the next few minutes um, from a very specific point of view. Um, I'll introduce myself a little bit more sort of through the slides here and, and my organization over the next two slides. Um, but I'm talking from the perspective of um, children and youth with special health care needs and disabilities and their families. Um, and I'm going to start with, you know, the importance of family voice um, that sort of led to the founding of, of our organization and our network. Um, and I'm going to highlight there's many voices, many children and youth and families that are, were involved in, in the disability rights movement over many decades. Um, but for the family voices um, movement, I'm going to highlight um, Julie Beckett and her daughter, uh, Katie Beckett, which um, they were in Iowa. And Katie... Um, was in the hospital at the age of three and her family said, no more, we need our daughter home. She needs to move out of this institutional setting and into our home. And that was a call of many parents at the time as well. And um, Julie Beckett figured out how to use her voice and Katie's voice even at that young age to connect to policymakers, Senator Grassley in, in Iowa and then President Ronald Reagan. And it led to the creation of the first home and community-based waiver, the Katie Beckett waiver. So I just sort of highlight to say um, that that's sort of the foundation of, of where I'm coming from. And, you know, a very specialized voice of, of parents of kids with special health care needs, um, but one that as um, Jocelyn so aptly put, you know, moving from that victim sort of mentality to heroes. Um, and I don't know if I, I'm claiming that we're heroes, but just really that we can find value in every voice, even amidst the chaos of having a child in a hospital in an institution. There's value in what families have to say about the system and about change. And there's a lot of brilliance in there, no matter how stressed out we are. Next slide, please. Um, so after um, Katie Beckett's waiver was formed. There was Julie Beckett and many other family leaders that got together with various public health entities, such as the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, um, and formed what's called Family Voices. Um, and there's several layers of our organization and our network. I work for the National Office of Family Voices, um, and we are a national grassroots uh, nonprofit. Uh, network of families and friends of kids with special health care needs and disabilities. Um, at the national level and at all of our network state levels, we are staffed by family members of kids with special health care needs. So we all have the lived experience of navigating health care, education, social service, all kinds of systems. Um, and that's really at the core of who we are. We're family serving and family led organizations. Um, and after the founding of the national office, um, the, the leaders at the time got together and pushed and pushed and got some funding to create a network of family led organization called family to family health information centers. And we've grown some over the years and so there's 59 so we're in each state, the District of Columbia, five territories and there are three tribal F2Fs as we call them for short family to family centers. Um, and we also have a network of um, state affiliate organizations. 
The tricky part of talking about family voices and family to family health information centers is there's not just one darn name that goes across all. So identifying the F2F in your own state can be tricky because it doesn't always follow family voices name or, or whatever. Um, but, you know, I highlight this about the organization, you know, to get to the best practice of, you know, establishing this, there's a connected group of community-based organizations. If you're wanting to connect with and partner with and engage um, families of kids with special health care needs, there's already this very small but mighty network in every state and, and the territories and tribal nations that, you know, you can connect and partner with um, to really create sustained rigorous, effective family engagement. I loved how when Shannon was talking earlier, she really was, um, I think, articulating the mantra of the disability rights movement and one that we use as well is nothing about us without us and the, the equity involved. And um, she was highlighting how the Center for Family Voice is not trying to usurp anyone's position or create anything new. In, in our realm of um, advocacy, we get very frustrated with all the new silos, create a new this, create a new that. But what about taking, coming alongside, as Shannon said, who's already in the network? Who's in the community? Who can we connect with? Come alongside and partner and listen to that voice. To me, what Shannon was articulating is team, which is a part of healthcare, team-based care, but something that we really struggle to get so that we're authentically all engaged at the table. Um, so next slide, please. What I thought I'd do over the, the next um, group of slides is just highlight some of the tools um, that Family Voices has used um, at the national level and that I use as the director of policy and that, um, that you guys can use in different ways because we can talk about all this stuff, but how do we come together and how do we amplify that voice if you don't have connections, if you're not sure what to do or where to go. So I thought I'd just highlight some, some particular tools. Um, this, this first set of tools that I wanted to just touch on um, are tools that I think really help cultivate a voice. Um, you know, we all have different kinds of voices and thoughts and ideas, um, and how do we share them? Can we share them? How do we come together? I can say one thing, but somebody can hear it a completely different way. So how do we come together in our voices? On the left of this slide, there's something called a care map. This is um, what we call o the OG or the original care map that was created by a mother, Kristen Lind, um, whose son was receiving care at Boston Children's Hospital. And she sat down at her kitchen table just trying to articulate, you know, at the you know, individual level with her pediatrician, no, this is what you think's happening, but I'm gonna draw you what's happening. Here's the ecosystem, here's what it's really like. Um, and I think that this, this tool is so powerful because it takes the narrative and helps translate it into practice and what's going on in the delivery of care, but also into the policy that needs to be made. Another one that I wanted to highlight on here is charting that's done. Um, Adam, some of you may have heard of um, this um, material called Charting the Life Course or Life Course Tools. It was actually created by the Family to Family Health Information Center in Missouri at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, UMKC. Um, and this is used by many of our family to family health information centers of how do you take what is going on in a young a youth transitioning into young adult life in medical care and education and job and profession and how do you capture what are their hopes and dreams um, and make it come to fruition um, and tie it up, up to all the systems. Um, so again, it's taking that narrative and the voice and figuring out how to cultivate it and how to share it and amplify it. Um, next slide, please. So I thought I would briefly just give um, a personal story, a little um, illustration from my, from my own life and advocacy. Um, this is what I call the Coleman Chaos Care Map. Very different version than that one drawn by Kristen Lind. And the way in which I created this, um, ooh, sorry, there's a little bit of graphic error on there, I see. Um, and I've, I've used this in very different ways, but um, I choose to have my care map as a picture of the family because I really wanna illustrate um, you know, as Jocelyn was referring to, you know, moving from sort of the, the victim or for us in, um, in disability world and, and in the care of children with special health care needs, there's a lot of discussion of the caregiver burden, right? And, and some of that is to figure out what is going on in the system for families, what's, what's stressing them out, what's happening. 
But so often that sort of burden becomes um, the focus and we admire the problem rather than saying, well, what are the joys here? Or what can we work and tweak in the system to make the changes so that things flow for the entire family, not just um, the child with special health care needs. So I've used this map in a variety of different ways to teach at medical schools. I've used it to illustrate policy changes that happen pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, and you can alter it along the way. But it's a tool that can be used, you know, at the individual level with families, um, you know, in just a team-based care setting, but then moved beyond to at an advisory board or, you know, with policymakers and Medicaid saying, here's what happened with the decisions and how telehealth played out for my family, but for multiple families, for example, with kids with medical complexity. Um, so there's a lot of things that it can do, I think, to illustrate. It has a lot of potential of taking voice and cultivating it and bringing people together to understand what's going on and to view a system together as a whole and through each other's eyes, right? Because we all on a team have different views and personalities and, and perspectives, and so we can move together. Um, so uh, on the right here, you'll see my daughter, um, Justice Hope, who's the one of my four children um, that had multiple disabilities and, and special health care needs. Unfortunately, she's no longer with us um, on this earth, but she surely is in spirit um, as she continues to guide all the work that I do. And I put this picture of her on here um, and, and make the reference to Anne Light because, um, you know, for a child as, as such as Justice, who was you know, quote unquote, nonverbal, non-ambulatory, and all these sort of nons that people think she doesn't have a voice. Um, tools like, like the care map and, and some of the other tools I show help cultivate a voice of even a child who doesn't have words um, to share and share their light with um, the world. Um, and I just leave you on this slide with a quote um, from that wonderful, the poet laureate at the inauguration um, the last lines of her poem, for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. And I add the words on there together, because that's what I think um, moving forward authentically is about, you know, in that trust um, and towards the light together. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of talk about um, in the best practices of, of training, and I see there's some questions about, you know, how do we help families cultivate their voice um, and other members of the team cultivate their voice through leadership training. Um, Family Voices as a national organization and then many of our F2Fs um, use two types of trainings. Um, one is called serving on groups that is used for those family members um, who have never been in any sort of advisory board or advisory group um, situation to understand, you know, the Roberts rules of order <laughs> and those sort of, you know, rules of how, uh, how things work in the interplay. But then also we use something, a training called leading by convening that is really getting all kinds of professionals and, you know, professionals, including the families and family leaders in there together around a table to coalesce around issues. I think um, these, both of these trainings are created by the National Center for Systems Improvement, um, which is a, is a center that's focused in particular on um, transforming state systems to improve outcomes for children with disabilities. But if you look at these trainings, they're all free and accessible. There's modules on there. Um, and then also if you connect with your local family to family, many of them provide these trainings and use them in different ways. But if you look at any of these resources, you can pull, there's materials. They're ones um, that can be used no matter who you are trying to engage and who you're trying to bring around the table. And one thing that I think is so powerful about the leading by convening in particular is that I know myself, um, you know, I, I am in, the, in a leadership role at Family Voices now where I'm using again my law degree and I also have a public health degree, you know, so I have letters after my name, not quote unquote, just my lived experience, which is way more important and has been often much more valuable than all that stuff I paid for. Um, but I've been in other capacities prior to this job where I'm sitting at tables and um, there's a lot of other people with letters after their name and stuff that just quite don't quite know how to come together. Um, and so this kind of training is really valuable, you know, and, and gets to that best practice of really investing in people first. 
Um, not necessarily the issues or the business stuff, but how we come together is in investing in, in each other as people so that we communicate intentionally with each other um, and we can exercise that humility and really figure out how to eliminate barriers and, and move forward together. Um, and I have also highlighted on here too that some of the fam local family to family health information centers have taken things from serving on groups or leading by convening or other training things, and then have very specialized programs that help develop um, family voices so that they can be engaged in policy making. A lot of families are referred to family to family health information centers for just that, what's in the title, that peer to peer support, but support is so much broader than often how we think about it. People are needing information, education, um, and training to be able to figure out how do I navigate this multiple systems and this confusion around me? How do I make sense of it? How do I articulate things? How do I bring about change like Julie Beckett did and get a waiver? Um, and so, you know, these family to family health information centers give that individual level um, walk alongside and help navigate a system, but then they also help people cultivate their voice to reach whatever levels they want and be able to, to amplify. So next slide. Just a quick, uh, another Kara and Justice um, example of the ways that these trainings helped help Justice and I. Um, I participated in when I was transitioning from being an immigration attorney, um, to, to sort of doing health and disability work, I wasn't sure where to go and what to do. So I did a training called Partners in Policymaking. I'm like, this is great. I have a law degree. Let me transition and make things work. Um, and so I um, did this program. And the first weekend, um, there was all kinds of other trainings that were special education law and law this, law that. But I was really... Um, not stuck in. I mean, it was really <laughs> engrossed in the in the people first language um, presentation. And I thought, you know, people are never going to be able to see my child who is nonverbal and non ambulatory and has very significant disabilities as a person for which they want to change laws and invest in her life and her future, unless they see her as a person. Um, and so for me, I wrote a children's book about justice that just taught that disability is natural um, as a way to raise awareness, not just with little kids, but later I used it in teaching in medical school and with adults to raise awareness about disability that leads to then policy change. Because if you're sharing that out and amplifying justice's voice, no matter how the voice is heard or expressed, um, you're leading to policy change down the way so that we see people and children with disabilities as people um, that, that are worthy of, of investment um, and worthy of, um, of policy changes, right? And policy investment. Um, so next slide, please. And the last tool that, that I wanted to highlight and share about is something called the Fit Family Engagement and Systems Assessment Tool. This is um, a tool that was funded by the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health. Um, that Family Voices created with um, quite a large uh, network of, of, of a working group or an advisory committee um, that is created, you know, it's not a validated measurement tool, but it's an assessment tool. It has formality to it so that you can score um, how you're doing, you know, in engaging families in systems level work. And you can use it very, um, you know, rigorously and strictly that way, but you can also be flexible with it to just inform if you're going to be, um, if you are a quality improvement project, or if you have a new advisory board that has, you know, formed at your, um, at your state agency, you can use a tool like the Family Engagement and Systems Assessment Tool, we call it FESAT for short, to really look at um, how should we start this? How should we go about thinking about this? Do we have a written policy about you know, engaging with families and a commitment to that? How do we know that all of our um, employees are engaged and um, feel supported in this? So you can use it to kind of assess and look at whether, um, whether, you know, whether you're ready and how to begin to think about it, but then you can also, you know, do your first consensus gathering and scoring together and then come again at six months or a year and check your progress. You can write action plans and other things. So the tool, I have a link at the end where you can go and um, 
and download it. But the tool itself has a user's guide and it has a tool and it has a scoring sheet. Um, and then it also has a compilation of strategies and resources that you can do um, you know, if you score a certain way and decide as, as a group that you're going to work on a particular goal, um, a big one for people to work on now and as we've talked about in the session is um, around representation. How do we ensure that we are serving and engaging diverse voices? Um, so you can link to the resource in the toolkit there for some different strategies and ideas that kind of map up with what um, you've got going on. Um, and your action plan. Um, so next slide, and then I'm almost done. Um, and I just wanted to sort of show, whoop, this got a little twisted around, sorry for the funny visuals. Um, but this is a little bit of an infographic that's just kind of illustrating how I was saying, you know, that there is rigor and structure to this, this tool, um, but it also can be used flexibly. Like if you want to just plan, where are we going to start? You can pull from the tool and figure out how to do it. There's a checklist where you don't even have to go through the entire score sheet that kind of gives you what are the things you want to think about and you can focus on it as a whole through all the domains or just, you know, as I mentioned, for perhaps you want to just focus on representation and how you recruit, um, you know, diverse um, family members um, and youth to, to your project. Um, the other one is you can use it, as I've said, to assess how are we doing. It just gives, you know, as, as Shannon was talking about, we don't want to just do this in air, right? We need measurement. We need evaluation to figure out how, how we're doing. Um, and so you can, you can use the FESAT tool that way. And then also you can use it to, um, you know, to figure out how to improve. The, the scoring um, mechanism that the way we have it set up now is that you have family leaders and professionals score it, everybody scores it individually, you have this whole team, and then you come together for a consensus process where you talk through the scores. And, and that, you know, if we're looking at that through that sort of equity lens now, you know, that, that a lot of us are, are using right now, that means there's going to be some uncomfortable conversations, but that's good, right? Because that's, that's the process through which we know that there's change and really authentic and meaningful things. We're not all going to have the same opinions. Hopefully our hearts line up and then we talk and we get our minds to line up and the plan together moving forward. So with that, I will stop talking um, and um, hand it back over, I think, to Anna. Thank you. Kara, thank you so much. That was um, so rich with information, um, both you and Jocelyn and Shannon. Um, lots for folks to think about. Um, so we have a couple questions um, that are coming through. Um, I want to pose one um, to uh, Shannon Jocelyn and you, Kara, um, and we can go in that order, but what are some best practices for ensuring diversity in family engagement activities, both racial and ethnic diversity, but also reaching parents and families who might not have previously participated in activities? I think for Queens Village, we are trying to reach out to Black families pri um, primarily, but we also recognize that there's a lot of diversity even within that. So there are Black families from way different backgrounds, from different socioeconomic statuses, with different education backgrounds. And so what we have done really is just make sure that we are getting into the community everywhere that we can touch Black women. And so where we just did something called a, a Queens Village Street Team, where we were out in the streets in various neighborhoods saying things like, hey, hey, I see you. And um, we talking to women on the streets. We, we are engaged on social media. We are engaged in the hospital system. We're engaged with other, um, uh, other nonprofits in the area. We, so really we take a robust um, approach to touching any place where black women and black babies may be. Um, I, I'll just add a few sort of things that we do and think about, you know, I think as a whole, our network is, is vast, but it, it, it is, as I said, we're small, but mighty. Um, there are, there are many uh, of our family, the family health information centers that in some way um, engage cultural brokers or cultural liaisons, because for a lot of times for us, when we're talking diversity, we're talking 
Somali families, we're talking, um, you know, black families where as, as Jocelyn just said, there are, you know, a black family in the South is different than a black family in New York. And so how, you know, there's experiences and depends on the health system you're going through and stuff. So, you know, staying grounded in our, our staffing as those who have gone through the system themselves may not be the exact same experience, um, but then trying to match up, um, you know, in culturally and linguistically appropriate ways. Um, in the last year, um, the national office received funding for um, it, the CARES Telehealth Act funding. And so we worked really hard. It was a fabulous learning experience for a lot of us of how do we take all kinds of telehealth and massive technology that like I was the first to admit, I have no idea what anyone's talking about, how to do that. And how do you make it accessible across many cultures and the languages that you use. Um, and we thought we were all good at like making things plain language for families, but there's so many layers of it. And so really being conscious of that and open again in that exercise humility and vulnerability and just saying, I'm not quite sure, but let's reach out and connect to the community, so. Can I also add that we, being a, helping us to reach out to all facets of Black women is part of the work of our boards. So when you're, we have all type of Black women on our board. We have Black women on our board who are highly educated. We have Black women on our boards who are living in, um, in the poor neighborhoods. And because of the trust that we have built with them, they then take our message on to their network of friends and their neighbors and their family members. Um, and that is how we're able to reach a broad um, number of Black women in Cincinnati. The only thing I would add to the really good feedback that um, both Karen and Jocelyn offered was um, from our standpoint and some of the work we're currently doing with the Ohio Department of Health with respect to infant mortality reduction efforts and um, the equity in birth outcomes is just being intentional about it. You know, who are we really trying to speak to? And then developing the um, opportunity to speak to, you know, to where those women are, but, but perhaps more importantly, establishing the relationship with the, um, the programs in the community that already have the trusting relationship. So, you know, from our standpoint, you know, we we view Queens Village for, you know, for an example, as one of those trusted organizations to come up alongside with. They have the trusting relationships and, and work with them to say, look, we really want to listen and learn and um, bring the members of Queens Village into this new power paradigm, this new decision-making paradigm. And so, you know, I think that's the intentionality around who are we trying to learn from and coming alongside in partnership with those who have the trusted relationships and, and, and utilizing them as a way to inform how we're going to, to proceed with the work. I, you know, this is Kara. I just want to comment that I think that is such a beautiful illustration, even how you pulled in Queens Village and how you guys work together of just, you know, that the culture shift that you highlighted earlier and that is so resonant in, in the report that it's not that um, it's not that the the information changes if we're talking about relaying science right and evidence, but it's how it is shared and what is shared that is really the the sort of culture change that often in public health work we come in and say well here it, you know here it is but you first start with as you said what is it that you need and being intentional about how you communicate the science, not just sharing it out. I don't know, that doesn't illustrate, maybe I'm getting too emotional, like this is really great. <laughs> of course the postman just arrived, so the dogs are bonkers. Um, Shannon and Carolyn, I think uh, you might also have um, 
something to add here, but how have policymakers, how receptive have policymakers, and then from the plan perspective, been to community, parent, family input on um, program and policy uh, making? And Shannon, you can start first, or Shannon, you can start first, then we'll go to Carolyn. Yes. So, Look, I'm a recovering um, politician, so I think that I can speak with experience regardless of your political persuasion or, you know, in what level of government that you operate. There is nothing more powerful than the personal stories of actual voters who are in your community. And so sometimes, you know, our communities can be very diverse. And um, so, so I think on one hand, politicians might only be familiar with parts of the community, but I think they're really receptive to um, hearing from, you know, voters from throughout their district. In fact, it's incumbent upon um, the community to really share that voice where the Center for Family Voice can really help intersect is, you know, to, to help build the confidence and the skills for families to thread that needle. So they are really speaking in their own voice, for using their own experience. That is really resonant with policymakers but as, as both Kara and Jocelyn pointed out, and in fact, Anna, and a lot of your best practices around how do we think about the barriers that families face in um, accessing programs? Well, the same is true in the barriers that they face in accessing um, policy development, you know, things like transportation and childcare, those same things apply. So how do we think about um, you know, really leaning into the strategies that we, we know that work, policymakers want to hear from their community. How do we make that happen in a way that's authentic and um, resonates with them? Yeah, I think Shannon's right. Just to add on, um, you know, putting back on my Medicaid director hat of when I used to oversee a lot of these programs. It's um, you know something you're always trying to get the answer to is what's going to work best for my members, what's going to work best for my consumers in terms of how we set this up, and then also how do we treat everybody in a fair and equitable way and um, get them the access that they're afforded. And you know, coming from a very rural state, there's a lot of communities where, as Shannon pointed out, people are not going to be able to just readily come to a meeting during the day and express what their feedback is about how you might be delivering dental benefits or vision benefits or prenatal care in their community. Um, so it's important that those regulators and those policymakers really get out there into those rural communities and listen and use entities, um, whether it's somebody like Jocelyn in your community or the work Shannon does, to hear what those people have to say in terms of making that design and making those decisions. Um, because all too often, and I can tell you it's true in my state, we end up with um, urban centers where there's a lot of care, um, people have or, or better access to services, and then people on the outside that are just kind of left behind. And you know, we don't want to pull people who have uh, special needs out of their community and their living center and saying, okay, now you have to be institutionalized or move into some kind of urban institution because we didn't do the work to serve you in your community. So I think um, you know, this just speaks, of course, to one of the reasons why. Um, the Molina Cares Accord funded this work is we really want to make sure that those voices are being heard um, across the states, but because we know that they result in better health outcomes. Um, so I'll tell you just one brief story and then uh, let it go back to you, Anna, for, for that information. Um, but in New Mexico, we have a thing called Project ECHO that was started by the University of New Mexico to go out and reach people in rural communities to bring them access to care and services, because we have such health disparity here, where we have people who are low income, who are ethnically diverse, some usually from tribal communities or other um, ethnically diverse communities who can't get access to care. So they can't get treatment in their home community for things just like hepatitis or, um, of course, now the COVID issues that we're all facing in the long term, 
COVID um, medical issues that people are facing. So using those kinds of services, whether it's like Project Echo or the work that Shannon does and Jocelyn does, has been one way that I know um, the Accord has really tried to, to amplify up getting those voices to the table. So we really appreciate all the community work done here to bring that together. Uh, thanks, Jenin and Carolyn. Um, Jocelyn, I think this is a question you may have addressed in the chat, but um, uh, Queens Village is really focused on empowering Black women. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, sort of, if you can speak to um, raising Black boys to become responsible dads, and what are some examples of strategies you use to engage um, men and fathers in your advocacy work? Yes, so um, the way that we have engaged our boys and our men is really by the same way that we engage Black women, is the, and that is by actually talking to Black boys and Black men and letting them lead the work. And so in this past year, we have, um, we have initiated a brother program to Queens Village, which is called King Stand, and it is led by Antoine Watson, and he is just in the beginning of his journey, just as we were three years ago, where he has created a board of Black men, and he's finding out from them what they think needs to be addressed in our, in our city. And so we're, we're at the beginning of this work. I can't say yet what they're going to say. But I do want to address something. I got a question in the chat, and it was about... Um, I can think of, of somebody who's watching this being glad that we are working to change the victim mindset of Black women. And I just want to push against that question just a little bit because that is not the focus of our work, to lift Black women out of a, black, out of a victim mindset. What our work is focused on, making sure that people who are going into their communities of Black women don't see them as victims, and that they recognize that Black women are fully capable of offering solutions and leading solutions to the problems that are, that are present in their community. Thanks, Jocelyn, for that clarification. Um, so we are just about out of time. I want to thank our speakers so, so much, uh, Shannon. Jocelyn, Kara, um, Carolyn for kicking us off and supporting this really important work. Um, lots of resources to share. Um, I appreciate all the attendees um, for sticking through it uh, with us to the end of this uh, webinar. And um, there'll be a very short um, evaluation survey if folks could just take um, one minute to fill that out, we'd be super appreciative. Um, so have a great rest of your Tuesday, um, great week, and um, thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye.